Welcome to Skycrest, everyone. If you would rise up and worship with us, that would be great. We're so happy you're here this morning. Let's sing this one out. This is called Worthy. Rumors of the Son of Man Stories of the Savior Holiness with human hands Treasure for
Well, good morning. Okay, so we got it. We we have to do this a little bit differently today, right? Or is everybody? Are people nervous? Let's wave. Turn around and smile and wave and welcome people. I don't think we're supposed to shake hands or hug or whatever. So we can we can always wave. I'm so glad you're here. Okay, you may be seated. After the government tells people not to go to church and people aren't going to go to basketball, I'm so grateful you're here. We sprang forward and, I mean, there are all kinds of obstacles to get into church today and here you are and it is going to be a fabulous day, I can assure you. Thank you so much. Let me just, there's a couple of announcements and uh, just a, a reminder for those of you who are interested, we will be presenting a budget after the service today. So if you want to grab your kids and come back in here, that's fine. Uh, but our team will be presenting the budget and we can approve that today. If you're serving in Sky Kids or you're interested in doing that, there's going to be a leadership training March 22nd. By the way, I'm just reading. You guys can do that too, right? Right off the connection guide or as Angela says, the bulletin know about the bulletin and then there's also we want to be praying for the mission trip to Atlanta that our students will be taking uh, next week and let me say if you're visiting we are grateful that you're here and there's a card in the seat back in front of you on one side it says connect and on the other side it says commit uh, for those of you who want more information or just who want us to know that you are visiting. We, we are grateful that you're here. And so this is a way that you share information. We don't sell it or anything like that. It's just a way that we can communicate with you. And you can take this card and take it to the, the greeting center right through those doors. We have a gift for you. And uh, then at the conclusion of the service, uh, oftentimes there are folks that want to make a commitment to following Jesus or maybe want to know about becoming a part of the Skycrest family or want to be baptized or whatever. This commit card is the way that you indicate to us uh, where you are on your journey, how we can pray for you. And so you want to take that out and be prepared to respond to God as we come to a close today. Well, I'm going to pray and we are going to continue to sing. Let's bow our heads. Father, We say with David, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. We are so grateful that we have the privilege of worshiping you. We're grateful that we get to open your word and hear from you. And we are grateful, Lord, that your word teaches us that when we gather in your name, your spirit is here with us. And we believe that by your spirit, we will be guided to truth, that we'll be challenged where we are uh, not in alignment with your desires. And Lord, we, we trust that we will be better worshipers, better husbands and wives and neighbors and employees because we have gathered in your name. Lord, we make space for you to have your will and your way with us here today and so hear our prayers meet our needs and reveal your glory it's in the strong name of Jesus I pray amen will you stand with us and worship the Lord
says that he is a wonderful counselor, almighty God, Prince of Peace. What a wonderful name it is. Father, we are so grateful that by your name, 
we are set free. We are called your children through the name, work, sacrifice, and victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So today, Father, I pray that our the thoughts of our minds, the intents of our hearts will all line up with your desire for us to live for your glory. As we open your word today, Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds, that we could see wonderful things in it, and in the end, Lord, that we would be transformed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, and everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. We are wrapping up our series today, Call Me Crazy. I'm really going to miss saying that every week. I love to say, call me crazy, because I think most of you do anyway. But do you guys remember the thoughts and prayers controversy that made headlines, I, I think beginning back in 2017? It began as a social media firestorm, but it quickly made it into the mainstream media. And... As a matter of fact, I read an article this week from Time Magazine that featured this article. Here, here's what it was called. Why, quote unquote, thoughts and prayers is a double-edged sword. The article began with these words. After the horrific shooting at a church in Sutherland Springs, Texas on Sunday. It was the shooting, by the way, in Texas that uh, claimed the lives of 26 worshipers that Sunday morning. The writer goes on to say, a rhetorical tennis match ensued. Some politicians offered up their quote-unquote hashtag thoughts and prayers, as many have follow, following other mass shootings. Others responded by criticizing quote-unquote thoughts and prayers as a pathetic substitute for taking concrete action. Now, if you remember, the issue was that we shouldn't be offering thought and prayers, but instead we should do something that, that will ensure that nothing like that ever happens again. And predictably, that issue became highly politicized. But the article avoiding the politics of the issue went on to talk about the hashtag. Listen to what she writes. The underlying sentiment is clearly a kind one. It's an expression of sadness and hope that a higher power will respond with something healing. And, and there's no counting how many politicians of all political stripes have used it. Thoughts and In times of tragedy, no one wants to say the wrong thing. I'm quoting. And so saying the thing that everyone else says or has been known to say seems like the right thing. And in the end, what struck me about the article is that the phrase thoughts and prayers is nothing more than an expression. For some, it's it expresses deep sorrow in the face of tragedy. And for others, it, it's nothing more than a cliche. It's something we say when we're not real sure what to say. But what's most interesting is that it never seemed to occur to the author that people conveying thoughts and prayers were actually praying. That it, it didn't seem to register that some people were actually conveying their thoughts to God and praying for His peace for those who were hurting. I thought that, that seems like an incredible omission. It's an article about thoughts and prayers with virtually no reference to prayer. But I'll be candid as I thought more about it. The truth is, I don't believe 
that those offering their thoughts and prayers are praying either. I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm a skeptic. And, and when I see the hashtag, I rarely, if ever, assume that the person offering it is actually taking their time to pray and invite God to do what only He can do in, in the face of tragedy. I, I don't believe the person is actually praying. And, and I, I mean, I, I'm highly skeptical. And by the way, of all things to be lying about or exaggerating about, thoughts and prayers? That should be the last thing that we aren't true to. And, and I'll, I'll just be candid. I'm even skeptical when I hear Christians talk about, not all of them, but many, when they say things like, I'll be praying for you. Maybe it's because there are times where I forget when I say I'll be praying for you. I'm just being honest. But, but it's also something about my suspicion that if we were honest, we would admit to the fact that we talk far more about praying than we actually pray. Why is that? Do we think that talking about it or talking about doing it is, is kind of doing it? That God will somehow count our intention as a prayer unto itself? Is it because we're too busy to pray, as one famous book said? Are we ashamed of the way we behave and so we try to avoid God and therefore we aren't praying people? Or maybe. Maybe it's that we're not sure we know how to pray. And so we, we just don't take the time to do it. Or, is it because we don't believe it works? The, the teaching of Scripture is crystal clear. For the follower of Jesus, prayer should be as automatic as breathing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. You know these verses. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now in Christian circles, we spend a lot of time searching for the holy grail of God's will for our lives, don't we? We talk about it incessantly, yet here it is in black and white. God's will for those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ is that they exist in a constant state of communication with Him. A stream of consciousness that includes relentless rejoicing, continual prayer, and ceaseless thanksgiving. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, how in the world would we stay in continual prayer? How, how, how could you possibly pull that off? Well, I think it requires us to think just a little bit differently about prayer. Okay, typically we think about prayer as what we do by ourselves. Maybe uh, if you're like me, you, you write your prayers out in a journal from time to time. And so we, we think about what Jesus termed the prayer closet. It's where we go and close ourselves off and we spend time with God and we're offering our petitions, our praise our adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and so the act. And, and, and that is important. But we can't do that unceasingly. Right? I mean, we have responsibility. We have children and jobs and all that 
stuff, the stuff of life. We are too, are we too busy to pray? But this kind of unceasing prayer that Paul is getting at in his letter to the Thessalonians is prayer that calls for us to be in tune with God like a mother is in tune with her infant and or like we are all of us in tune with our cell phone. Right, ready for it to buzz and beep or send a message all the time. We know where it is, and if we've lost it, we want to know where it is. Find my iPhone. And so we're constantly aware, in touch with our phones, and this unceasing prayer, continual prayer, relentless rejoicing, that requires that we are aware of God, just as we are aware of our phones. So why, if we know those, the basic rules, if we understand the teaching of Scripture, why do we struggle so much? Despite those directives from God for continual praying, I, I think a vast majority of followers of Jesus Christ, wildly committed new first-time followers and growing followers of Jesus, all of us, Many of us fall woefully short. God's desire. Are we too busy? Probably. Do we struggle with the right way to pray? For some people, that is a very real problem. But I think when we dig down and get to the very bottom of the issue. I, th I think we don't pray because we don't understand this one great truth about prayer. Call me crazy, but listen, God delights in answering your prayer. I'm going to say that again because I'm not sure we all believe that. God delights in answering prayer. He loves it. Now, listen, that doesn't mean He's obligated to always do it. To always answer the prayer you prayed. He's not, we can't obligate him to do that. Just because I remember to pray doesn't mean God is going to answer the prayer that I pray. Though he loves answering prayer, he delights in doing it. There are times when he won't. James provides one reason. That God doesn't always respond in James 4, 3. He says, when you ask, you do not receive. There's an example of God not answering prayer. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. That, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So God, according to James, doesn't always answer prayers because some of them are based on hedonistic desires to get what we want. And God's not always, as a wise parent, God is not always going to answer those prayers. Peter gives us another reason in 1 Peter 3, 7. He says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, by the way, don't get nervous about Peter saying treat them as the weaker part, okay? L let me tell you what he's saying. Treat your wife as if she is a rare, precious, or vase, whichever way you want to look at it. Treat your wife as Christ treated the church. He died for his bride. And so what Peter says is, listen, guys, if you want your prayers to be answered, and, and they don't seem to be getting answered, go back and check the way you're living with your wife. Because that can hinder your prayers.
Jesus himself taught about a really important ingredient in answered prayer. Perseverance. Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep praying. Don't ever, ever, ever give up. Sometimes we offer one prayer and forget. And I don't know, I don't know what it is about persistence or perseverance, but the scripture teaches that when we persevere in prayer, God responds. It, maybe it's a faith building. The fact is that God delights in answering our prayers. And I think the reason is because answering prayer provides God with an opportunity to distinguish himself from all other gods. From all other things we turn to for hope. It's a chance for him to demonstrate his love, his compassion, his omnipotence. It, it, it's a chance for God to show that he desires to be in a meaningful, open, communicative relationship with his creation, with his children. And when he responds to our request, he's not only rewarding our faith, which can also be a prerequisite to answer prayer. He's not only rewarding our faith, but he's building it. And at the same time, he's establishing the faith of others. When God answers prayer, he shows himself to be the one true God. There is a great story in the book of Kings that, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, but, but we're going to look at it in detail today. And it's the story, so it's 1 Kings, if you want to find the book in your Bible or on your phone. It's right before 2 Kings, that shouldn't be a surprise, but it's also after First and Second Samuel. So uh, about a quarter of the way into your Bible, you will come across 1 Kings. A little background, at the time of this story, Israel was being led by the horrible king Ahab. He was so bad. Okay, I'm going to do this. You remember how this worked? Somebody says, he was so bad, and then you say, oh, that is fabulous. Thank you for participating. He was so bad. He was so bad that 1 Kings 16 tells us that Ahab did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the other kings of Israel before him. Now, there were some bad, wicked kings, but all of them put together didn't get under God's figurative skin as much as Ahab did. He was a bad dude, but his treachery was aggravated because he was under the spell of his most wicked wife, Jezebel. She was an exceedingly wicked woman whose sole desire in life, her primary passion, was to completely eradicate the worship of the one true God in Israel. And, by the way, she would kill anyone who stood in her way. Now, the effect of the first family's wickedness on Israel was that people just kind of covered their bases in worship. They half-heartedly and secretly worshipped God, trying to woo Him and attain His favor. At the same time, they half-heartedly, maybe even holding their nose, followed Baal. And God wanted it stopped. And so God tapped the prophet Elijah to go warn Ahab, saying, don't make me count to three, like God had had with him. Okay, and so in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, here's what the scripture says. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew 
nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, here's what we have to understand about pagan worship or worship in that day. The idea was that that people worship their God, the God they chose, in hopes of currying favor from that God for their families and their crop. Uh, as any farmer will tell you, it depends upon rain, sunshine, weather, all of that stuff to make it work. And so they sought their God. Now, God was going to show them once and for all that he is the one they could trust with those things. Baal would have no power to end this drought that God was sending on the nation of Israel. And so the scripture says in the third year of the drought, God sent word to Elijah, hey, I'm ready to send rain. But before he did so, he, he needed to teach Israel a lesson. And so Elijah met up with Ahab and issued a challenge. Now we're going to camp out in 1 Kings chapter 18. Okay, so flip over to 1 Kings chapter 18. And we are going to stay in that chapter for a bit today. 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 19. This is Elijah talking to Ahab. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah to eat at Jezebel's table. Now here, here's what's happening. Elijah decides that he's going to set up a showdown based on God's word. He's going to set up a showdown on Mount Carmel. Now from Mount Carmel they could stand and look over the plain where all the Israelites live and they would be able to see the devastation of this three-year drought that was going on. And Elijah said, look, here, here's what I want. I want you to bring all the prophets of Baal. And then there was a secondary god, Asherah, that they were worshiping. Bring all of those prophets. And if you do the math, 450 plus 400 is 850 false prophets against one real prophet, Elijah. He was the prophet of God. And so once the group got together, by the way, really good math on your part today. Thank you. Once the group got together, Elijah took charge. First, he stepped in and challenged the people. And then he challenged the prophets. Look at verse 21. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? Remember, we learned that they were kind of half-worshipping God, secretly worshipping God, and they were also worshipping Baal. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal is God, follow Him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Here's what you do. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves, one of the bulls, and let them cut it into pieces and put it on wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull, put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, yeah, makes sense. What you say is good. Now, the ground rules were simple. They made sense to everyone. We're, we're going to have a sacrifice. You're going to sacrifice to Baal. I'm going to sacrifice to God. Build up an altar, put wood on it, slice up the beef, put it on the wood, but don't set fire to it. You're going to pray and see if Baal will respond, sending fire in acceptance of your sacrifice. And then I'm going to pray and we'll see if God hears my prayer and responds, sending fire to accept my sacrifice. And the God who responded 
to their prayers would prove himself to be the one true. Look at verse 25. Elijah said to the prophet Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. You guys go first. Call on the name of your God. By the way, the reason it was important to have a lot of prophets there is because of what they believed was required for Baal to hear them. Okay, It is a huge point that's rarely brought out in this text. One prophet of God, one person to pray, can make all the difference. 450 prophets of Baal. Well, let's see what happens. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, still nothing. Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder. They even slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. See, they had to show Baal how serious they were. They had to get his attention. Midday passed. And they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one even paid attention. Nothing. Well, listen, here was the idea of pagan worship. There's a God in heaven or wherever you are. And that God was at least, maybe at most, casually disinterested in the little people that turned to him for his attention. And so these pagans believed that they had to go to great lengths to get their God's attention. First, 450 cry out. That didn't work. So they started to dance around the altar, just making some noise, hoping that he pays attention. That didn't work. They began to cut, bleeding, trying to demonstrate to Baal how serious they were. Okay, as, as they're going through all of these crazy practices of sacrifice, Elijah, knowing there's no Baal to answer, begins to taunt them. Oh, you know what? Maybe he's trapped. Maybe he's deep in these contemplation. Maybe he's busy. And the Hebrew word there seems to indicate that Elijah was saying he was in the bathroom. So deposed. Maybe, just maybe, maybe he's asleep. And you need to wake him up. He was speaking into their belief. All of that was possible. That's why some in some versions of pagan worship in that day, they especially to the god Malek, they offered their children in the Why? Because they believed they were dependent upon that god to provide for them what they needed. So their family, their, their farms, and their families could survive. But the really sad part was they, they, they were praying to a God who wasn't paying attention. Who may or may not answer their prayers. Who may or may not respond to their dances or their, or their child sacrifice. Enough. Prophets of Baal dancing around on Mount Carmel. Six hours. 
no return. So, Elijah, look at verse 30. It was his. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here. They came. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. All of this, by the way, is, uh, is Elijah preparing to worship God according to God's expectation. This is the way God told them to approach. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he, he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two say as a seed. And he arranged the wood, he cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. And the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. Do you see what he's doing? He doesn't want them to explain away what God's about to do. Now listen, I don't... I don't it's easy for us to separate ourselves from these fabulous stories like this. These heroes and they never struggled with doubt or anything. But I want you to imagine, here's the king and the queen and 450 prophets who will kill anyone who stands in their way. Prior to this meeting, after Elijah said it's not going to rain for until I say it is, he disappeared. And the reason he disappeared is because he needed to keep breathing. They would have killed him. And now he's called for this showdown on the side of the mountain. And he knows, he knows if God doesn't respond to him, he's dead. So this is not just a prophet cavalierly going about his business. This is sobering for Elijah. And he knows God told him to do it. He's choosing obedience. But you know what? Sometimes even obedience is fearful, isn't it? We know exactly what God says to do. We know how he says he's going to reward us. It can be for the way we treat people, or it can be about prayer. It can be about the way we manage our finances, any of those things. We, we know what he says, and we know he comes through, but it can still be really scary because we're taking a step of faith. We're getting out of the boat, and we're walking on water, and we're not sure if we're going to sink or not. And so here's what I on the side of that mountain. And any three or four of those guys killed him. But 450 of the Baal prophets and 400 of the Asherah prophets and the king and the queen and surely all of their bodyguards. All the people were there. Sobering moment. So maybe it was like, okay, stack the wood, get the bull. I'm going to bowl. So great. And this is what he's verse 30. the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. That's where we go, Lord, 
I know you told me to. And that's why I'm doing it. Like, I don't have any other reason to be doing this. I did this because you told me to. If, like the desperate cry of faith, I'm doing it in obedience. Verse 37. Answer me. Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dirt, and it also licked up the water in the trench. That's an answered prayer. Now, what did he pray? Really simple. He reminded himself and all the people there just exactly who he was praying to. He acknowledged who God was, the God of Israel. He also professed that he was doing this in obedience to God's commands. That he was committed to God's vision, whether it scared him or caused doubt or whether he even wondered if God would hear him. But he was doing it because he was commanded. And then, in the end, he asked God to answer. Because he knew God answered that prayer. God would be glorified one through And not only did fire fall from heaven and burn up the beef, it burned up the wood, the rock, soil, and it lapped up the water in the trench. what happened? Exactly what he said. Look at verse 39. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. How did they know? Because God answered prayer. That was the point. Remember? Here's what we're going to do. You build an altar and pray, and I'm going to build an altar and pray, and let the one true God answer. And he did. God wants to reveal that he is God. Therefore, God delights in answering prayer. He answers prayers that bring light to darkness. He answers prayers that exercise faith because they build up faith. He answers prayers that expand his kingdom. Your kingdom come on earth just as it is in heaven. God answers that prayer. Sometimes, James told us, you have not because you ask. Sometimes you ask not because we're just not sure if he'll answer. Listen. Don't hesitate to ask. The no may guide you to truth it may transform you, but the answer will reveal God. Don't shy away from the possibility. Listen, in our world, people may not worship Baal, but, but they worship people or they worship power or pleasure and money and all those things we serve, all those things we bow to, and none of them will ever answer. None of them will ever meet our deepest needs or satisfy our desires. 
Why? Because they're not God. Only God, only God can do that. And when God answers our needs and meets our desires and gives us joy, things begin to change because his kingdom is coming and his glory is being revealed. Only God, only God can do that. And sometimes God only does that in response to our prayers. Is it any wonder is it any wonder that Paul said, pray continually? And yet we're too busy or distracted or afraid we, we don't really know how. And sometimes, sometimes we forget to remember that God delights you to bow your heads and just think for a moment. I, I want you to look back on your week. Just hit rewind on the tapes. And I want you to consider your prayer life. doing there? And I want to challenge you just to make a decision. This week is going to be different. walk out of this room today that you're going to ask God to teach you to be aware of him and his presence the same way that you're aware of your phone or your child. If you aren't sure how to pray, ask him to teach you. Just tell him you're, you're, you're available. You know, it's interesting, the disciples thought they knew how to pray because they were committed to God, but when they watched Jesus pray, they said, hey, why don't you teach us how to do that? And he did. And he's still in that business. So ask God to direct your prayers. But commit to prayer. Will you, will you commit to prayer this week? Not hedonistic, give me what I want prayers. But prayers that invite God to do what he wants. Build your church. Save my friends. Change your world change me. God loves to answer those prayers. Father, we are so grateful that from beginning to end, your scripture is clear that you hear and respond prayers that build your kingdom and glorify your name. So, Lord, this week I pray that you would teach us to do just that. Pray for your glory. Pray that your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. And if there are any, if there's anybody here today that you're saying, gosh, I'm, I'm not sure about God answering prayer. I'm not even sure I believe. You need to understand that Jesus through his sacrifice, opened the door so that you could make a connection with God. And the scripture says that as because he raised, was raised from the dead and ascended back into heaven, he is 
seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you. When, when you place your faith in Jesus, you have a connection with God. So if, if you haven't believed, but you're thinking, gosh, I, I, I want to connect with God. I've heard the story. I understand what Jesus did, but I'm, I'm just not a follower. There's no better time than this one, this day, to begin following Jesus. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for the truth of your word. We're thankful, God, that you are a father in heaven who answers prayer, who shines your light and changes this world. And I pray, Lord, that you would find us faithful in doing the work of prayer. And I pray, Lord, that for the bold prayer, prayers that will be prayed from this body of believers this week, that you would show yourself to be the one true God by answering those prayers for your glory. It's in the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Sing this out with us one last time. Thank you so much.